We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Wednesday edition of Free Association Radio. This is Robert Phoenix, and you are listening to Navigating the Astrological Matrix. And uh, I will be your chief navigator here for the next 90 minutes as we carry them and careen across the story of the stars for this day and others, past and future. So welcome. We'll be doing live readings today, as always on Wednesday. This is my community service. A lot of times people will say, hey, can you look at my chart? Or, hey, can you do you see anything in here? If you are one of those people, this is the time for you to call because it's a time where I have uh, 90 minutes pretty much of open space and time, and I can devote it to you to look at what's happening in your life. So welcome to the show. Uh, Today's an interesting day in terms of birthdays. It's the birthday of Jimi Hendrix. And Bruce Lee. And I, I did a post on them a long time ago. Uh, they're, they're two, uh, they, both those guys played huge roles in my life as a kid. I uh, was a total Jimi Hendrix freak. Loved Jimi Hendrix. I think one of the first eight track, I'm, when I'm not even talking cassettes, eight track tapes that I purchased was Jimi Hendrix. Actually, it was purchased for me. I'll never forget it. I graduated from the eighth grade, so I must have been about, I think I was around 13. I was 13. And as my eighth grade graduation gift, my parents bought me a little stereo. It's probably the worst thing they could have ever done, by the way. Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll, 1970s. 73, that stereo became a portal to my descent. I'm telling you right now, bad move on their part. Anyway, so they take me down to the local stereo store. And stereo stores back in, in the day were great places to hang out for a lot of different reasons. Generally speaking, they were big because equipment was big. It hadn't been completely miniaturized and transistored yet. So they would have rooms dedicated to, you know, significant stereos with significant speakers and tube driven amps and all that stuff, which is tremendous. So you could walk around the stereo store and you could take in the sort of warm, effusive analog feel of everything, because everything was pretty much analog then. There wasn't anything really digital. I mean, there were transistors, obviously, there were circuit boards, 
but most everything was, you know, analog sort of tubes. It was mostly tubes. But even the transistor stuff was still pretty much analog because it was all plain analog recordings. And stereo stores used to have records too. They'd have record racks. So you could walk around, look at the equipment, go through the records. It was a cool scene. And there was always the the, equip, the uh, accessories, headphones, tubes, wires, you know, cool stuff. Anyway, they take me to the local stereo store, and then they get me a little Panasonic. Panasonic used to be my favorite brand. Everybody loved Sony. I was a Panasonic guy. What does that say about me? I thought Panasonic was a quality product, and you didn't have to pay Sony prices. Anyway, they bought me this little Panasonic stereo and it was an eight track tape player it didn't even have a record player eight track tape stereo two speakers boom love that thing and they said you can buy four eight track tapes i'm like this is great i'll i remember to this day the four eight track tapes that i purchased one was i think it was the doobie brothers I think it was the Doobie Brothers. That's right. It was the Doobie Brothers. Two, Black Oak, Arkansas. Three, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, Birds of Fire. And four, Cry of Love, Jimi Hendrix. Now, I knew the Doobie Brothers because they played them on the radio all the time. And they were actually from the Bay Area. And I knew Black Oak, Arkansas because I had seen them on... Uh, an ABC in concert broadcast of a concert, I think it was from Riverside, called California Jam. It was a big deal. It sort of kicked off the whole kind of festival, sort of commodified festival series that would become very popular in the 70s, the 80s, and uh, even into the 90s to a certain extent. The massive concert tours, right? Day in the Green, you'd have all these bands coming into these massive stadiums where the sound was crap, but you got to see a lot of music. And California Jam sort of kicked that off anyway. Black Oak, Arkansas was on the show. And I loved uh, the song called Jim Dandy to the Rescue. I thought it was great. I bought their record. bought the, the A-Trek cassette. Now, Mahavishnu Orchestra, I'd never heard before. But I loved the cover. And, it, and the, it was the Birds of Fire, and it looked great. And then I took it home, and I plugged it in, and put my headphones on, and I had my head blown. It was John McLaughlin and Jan Hammer and all these you know guys who used to play with Miles Davis doing this amazing jazz fusion. Blew my mind, changed my life forever. And then, of course, there was Hendrix's Cry of Love, and uh, which is not it, – it's actually a record released posthumously – but has some great Jimi Hendrix songs on it. So there was Hendrix, and of course Bruce Lee. I remember the first time I saw Bruce Lee, he it was at the drive-in theater. And my father was, uh, both my father and I were really into martial arts. And so we saw Bruce Lee at the drive-in theater. It was great. It was, I believe, Fists of Fury. And the sound was dubbed. I didn't care. Some English guy, American guy was, you know, Bruce Lee's voice. I just knew that Bruce Lee was kick-ass. And I used to watch him as a kid in the Green Hornet. So anyway, I wrote this piece about uh, Bruce Lee and Jimi Hendrix. Uh, this is a while ago. Um, what's the date stamp on this thing? This is November 28, uh, 2010. So this is uh, three years ago. And the uh, title of this is Ass Kicker and Guitar Picker. I'm going to read you the whole thing. So we have 90 minutes, right? Nobody's on the phone. Nobody wants a reading yet. Do you mind? I don't think so. Okay, here we go. It's my show anyway. It says here, uh, yesterday, because I wrote it after the fact, remember that. Yesterday was the birthday of Bruce Lee and Jimi Hendrix, two significant ass-kicking culture heroes for me and millions of other kids from the 60s and 70s. Not only born on the same day, three years apart, they shared some other unique details regarding one another's lives. Both were one of five children. 
Both were troublemakers as youths. Lee was a street fighter and Hendricks a joyrider. Essentially what that means is Bruce Lee used to get into street fights in Hong Kong. He fought a lot. He was an angry young man, although he was also a dancer and an actor. He had the sort of artistic side, but he, was, he also got into he, – in fact, he got into trouble. He beat up the wrong kid in Hong Kong, and he had to leave. And Jimi Hendrix used to steal cars. He used to steal cars and drive them around. Both eventually gained popularity in countries other than their own, Lee in the USA and Hendrix in the UK. It's true. Jimi Hendrix became very popular in the United Kingdom. In fact, that's where he, you know, really kind of blew up. And Bruce Lee, of course, here in the United States, both lived in Seattle. And both are basically buried there. Uh, So Lee, Bruce Lee is buried uh, in Seattle and Jimi Hendrix in Renton, which is not far from Seattle. So they're both buried there. They both had two kids, one boy, one girl. It's true. Jimi Hendrix has a boy and a girl out of wedlock. Some people think that, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Green. Uh, it'll come to me. It might be his, actually be his son. Anyway, uh, both had two kids, one boy, one girl. Both had Nordic slash Caucasian mates. Uh, Monica Daneman for Jimi Hendrix and Linda Lee for Bruce Lee. And, yes, they knew each other. Both died under mysterious circumstances. But what we remember most about each of them is how they took their respective crafts to stratospheric heights. When Hendrix landed in London, Clapton and uh, in London, Clapton, and Pete Townsend were both spellbound and terrified of Jimmy's chops. The Who even refused to go on stage after Hendrix at Monterey Pop. With Lee, he was often chastised. Okay, with Lee. He was often chastised by Chinese masters to not teach his craft to Americans. Lee refused to bow down and challenge masters to send someone over to his school in Oakland to settle it once and for all. Lee decimated the poor lout. From there, they began to innovate and extrapolate on their work. But as we look at their charts, we can see how each other was taking a different vector. Jimmy had a tight stellium in Sag, Sun, Mercury, and Venus. Son of Mercury took up residence at the edge of his 11th house, freedom-loving and iconoclastic. Venus dipped into the 12th house, the house of source and mystery, the house where likely his last lover, Monica Daneman, had some knowledge regarding the mystery of Jimmy's death. Hendrix was likely killed by his manager, who was freaking out over the fact that Jimmy was going to dump him. He'd rather sacrifice the cash cow than let it get away. This is, this is the rumor, by the way. Uh, Coroners found unusual amounts of wine soaked in Jimmy's lungs. Never one for downers. They were forced down his throat with large amounts of wine. Hendrix eventually choked on his own vomit. Snuffing rock stars goes all the way back to Jesus. The royalties on Psalms were priceless. Jimmy was just another sacrifice at the altar of mammon. Buddy Holly took that dive, Brian Jones and Janice too, but I digress. Uh, Hendrix with that wild sag in the house of the future was all about Freedom, baby. Moon and Cancer conjunct Jupiter made him both sensitive and shy, though able to intuit and feel tidal waves of energy, oceans of space across the planes of time. In the seventh house, it made him an intuitive and generous love partner. Saturn conjunct Uranus and Pisces lent him some real discipline in getting his chops down. Saturn in the sixth and Uranus in the fifth. He worked hard at his craft. He was conven- he, he was unconventionally creative, flamboyant to the extreme. Of course, there is Pluto and Leo, like a golem in the eighth house. Fortunately for Jimmy, it was in the service of his Sag Stellium trining all three. What's amazing about Hendrix's chart is that from the sun to Pluto, he has no squares, oppositions. Uh, he has no squares, oppositions, but zero squares. They do show up in his true node in Chiron. In fact, he has a crisis of squares in Chiron, as it squares that same Sag Stellium, plus Uranus and Pisces. Chiron and Leo made him compelling and magnetic, but also extremely vulnerable when performing. But zero squares. Bruce Lee's chart is equally remarkable. While Jimmy was exploring the moons of Jupiter in his art via his Sag stellium, Lee had dueling stelliums. His Sag sun was the only Sag planet in his chart. He had moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, all in Scorpio. Moon and Mercury were conjunct, while Venus and Mars 
connected. But the four of them were not conjunct together. He was instinctual to the point of being psychic. Mars and Scorpio gave him great generative and regenerative powers. In fact, while training, he nearly broke his back. His ability to recuperate is legendary. But sitting across from that mass of psychic wiring, he had Saturn, Jupiter, and Uranus, all in Taurus. This clearly illustrates how deeply invested Lee was in controlling the mind, Scorpio, over the body, Taurus, and unleashing the body in the service of the mind as defined by will. Like Hendrix, Lee also has Pluto in the eighth, but his Pluto is in a dangerous square dance with Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, and the moon. Pluto squaring all those planets with Lee's razor edge, particularly the Mars-Venus squares. His sun, oddly enough, is unaspected until it hits Pluto, which it trines. The Sun-Pluto trine is immense power, but Lee's chart is marked by opposition. Nine in all. So you have Jimi Hendrix, right? Jimi Hendrix with no squares. He has oppositions. And Bruce Lee, nine oppositions. So that would mean that there was a lot of opposition in his life, which ultimately there was. That's how he died. The opposition took him out. With Sun in the 12th house and the Scorpio stellium, it's no wonder Lee's great analogy is associated with water. Be like water, was his famous saying. When water is in a cup, it becomes the cup. This chart has almost too much energy. A grand fixed square. Pluto in the eighth, Scorpio Taurus stellium was more than a normal human could bear. It would take the likes of a Bruce Lee to survive such powerful aspects. With Neptune in the 10th house, Lee was destined to become a philosopher, a mystic, a warrior, poet. But also in Neptune in the 10th house, we can see with the arc of his legacy that his death is sort of shrouded in mystery, right? Very Neptunian circumstances around, around his death. Hendricks and Lee were cultural giants, mythical icons, Superman, deeply flawed in some ways as humans. But they blazed a trail across the skies of our mind and attained an immortality that befits their outrageous gifts. So you can go to my website, robertphoenix.com, and you can look at their charts, which are fairly similar in some ways, fairly similar. So that all those uh, Scorpio planets in Lee's chart, well, some of them moved down into the 12th house because of the edge. They're right at the edge of the 11th and the 12th. But they both had Pluto in the 8th house. To me, that was really remarkable, Pluto in the 8th. And they both met with these really... Uh, strange, intense, unti- you know, considered untimely, and untimely deaths in some ways. Pluto in the eighth. Anybody that has Pluto in the eighth house, you are an intense person. Life for you is not a casual affair. Trust me. All right, so here we are. Uh, it is one eleven. Thank you for taking that little journey. Actually, I have one eleven to twelve eighteen. Thank you for taking that little journey. Uh, into memory. So, anyway, uh, where is everybody? Oh, there's a lot of people in the chat room. There's 13 people there. 13 people. Saw the gardener pop in. She was in here listening, doing her thing. Uh, today is also Caroline Kennedy's birthday, Sagittarius. Caroline Schlossberg Kennedy. You know, she's a uh, she, she's in the Obama administration. I think she's a, a diplomat or an ambassador to some other country. Uh, sun at five degrees Sag, Moon twenty seven, Virgo eighteen, Mercury Scorpio, Venus nineteen, Capricorn, Mars twenty four, Virgo, Jupiter nineteen, Cancer, Saturn sixteen. Scorpio, Uranus, eight, Aries, Neptune, two, Pisces, Pluto, ten, Capricorn, true node, seven, Scorpio, true node, moving backwards towards Libra, Chiron, nine, Pisces. That's where we're at in the sky right now. So we move into Moon and Libra over the Thanksgiving holiday. You know, I was in Facebook today, and I just asked very quickly, what are people eating tomorrow? I'm interested. And some of the responses I got were fascinating. 
there are people that are fasting because they don't believe in the holiday or they don't believe in Thanksgiving or out of deference to the, uh, the ancestors who were here that helped out the, uh, the settlers completely understand that by the way, I have no judgment about that. Some people are having pre Fukushima fish. Some people are having, uh, I haven't had anybody say they're having Turkey yet. That has not come up. Nobody's having Turkey. At least they are, but if they are, they haven't put it up there. So I, myself, I'm probably going to have tamales. I'm going to be flying solo tomorrow. A strange, a strange thing, to be honest with you. Very strange thing. But hey, this is what happens when you uh, live... Well, this is what happens when Saturn is transiting your 12th house, which is what's happening for me. The whole notion and concept of being alone is uh, really starting to kind of reverberate through my consciousness. It, it's kind of intense in some ways, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to get used to it. So anyway, tomorrow I will have tamales. I'm going to go find some Mexican restaurant somewhere that's open. And out of deference to the first people here, I will eat tamales, corn. That's what I will do. Let's see if there's any other interesting birthdays today. Who do we have? Don Adams from Get Smart. Today is his birthday. Paul Brunton. Today's Paul Brunton's birthday. He's an interesting guy. Uh, If you don't know about Paul Brunton, he was kind of one of these self-styled American wizard mages. He was an esotericist, author, yogi, um, mystic. He he had a uh, a relationship with – what's that guy's name? He was a a therapist, an American therapist. Anyway, Paul Brunton was – he was born in England – in 1898, and he was kind of in that that style of mystic that Gurdjieff was. He was kind of a Gurdjieff um, sort of character. Gurdjieff, Rorick, you know, these guys were cruising around the early part of the 20th century, putting together, you know, threads of esoteric thought and quote-unquote enlightenment. Let me see if I can give you a bit of a background on Paul Brunton because he had an impact on a on a therapist, pretty pretty famous therapist. Let's see if I can find this here. I'll read you his story. Let's see, here we go. Um okay, here we go, yes. I'll read you Paul Brunton's bio. Uh, he was born in London in eighteen ninety eight. His, his original name was Raphael Hurst. He was a bookseller and journalist. Uh, Brunton wrote under various pseudonyms, including Raphael Meridian or Meriden and Raphael Del Monte. Later, he chose the pen name Brunton Paul. But for some reason, perhaps a printer's error, the names were reversed to Paul Brunton, a name that he kept. He served in a tank division during the First World War and later devoted himself to mysticism and came into contact with theosophists. So those theosophists, they're everywhere. Uh, being partner of an occult bookshop, the Atlantis Bookshop in Bloomsbury, Brunton came into contact with both the literary and occult British intelligentsia of the 1920s. This is a very big time, by the way, for mysticism. Huge. The huge wave of mysticism, and a lot, and a lot of it winds up in America. There were a number of American, there were a number of gurus that showed up in America right around that time, including Paramahansa Yogananda. Uh, in the early 1930s, Brunton embarked on a voyage to India, which brought him into contact with such luminaries as Mir Baba, Sri Shankarchara of Kanch, uh, Kanchipuram, and Sri Ramana Maharshi. Those are the TM, uh, Maharshi is the TM guy. When Brunton met, Shank, met the Shankar Chachara, 
uh, of Kanchipuram, he was directed to meet Sri Ramana. Brunton's first visit to Sri Ramana's ashram took place in 1931. During this visit, Brunton was accompanied by a Buddhist bhikshu, uh, formerly a military officer, but meanwhile known as Swami Prajananda. So we have a, a military officer who's now a Swami. The founder of the English ashram in Rangoon, Brunton asked several questions, including what is the way to God realization? And Maharshi said, Vichara, asking yourself the who am I? Inquiry into the nature of yourself. Brunton has been credited with introducing Ramana Maharshi to the West through his books, A Search in Secret India and The Secret Path. One day, sitting with Ramana Maharshi, Brunton had an experience with Steve Taylor names, an experience of genuine enlightenment, which changed him forever. Brunton describes it in the following way. I find myself outside the rim of world consciousness. The planet has so far harbored me, the planet which has so far harbored me disappears. I am in the midst of an ocean of blazing light. The latter I feel rather than think is the primeval stuff out of which worlds are created, the first state of matter. It stretches away into untellable infinite space, incredibly alive. The times of World War II, Brunton spent in India being hosted a guest by the Maharaja of Mysore, His Highness Sri Krishna Raja Widyar IV. He dedicated his book, The Quest of the Overself, to the Maharaja. And when the Maharaja died in 1940, he was present at his funeral. Brunton was later prevented from visiting the Sri Ramana Maharshi ashram. I wonder why that was. But he maintained a strong interconnection with Ramana Maharshi. In Ramana Maharshi's last year, he sent a message to Brunton saying, When heart speaks to heart, what is there to say? Brunton also made a notable comment on Mahatma Gandhi and the struggle for Indian independence in general while speaking of his conversation with an Indian college student in his work, his search in secret India, which he reveals quite another facet of his personality. I discovered, too, that he was not yet succumbed to the hysteria for politics, which has attacked most of the young students in the towns. Though India is now in the throes of the long turmoil, which Gandhi has aroused into being in his effort to disturb the relations between white rulers and brown ruled. <laughs> After two decades of successful writing, Brunton retired from publishing books and devoted himself to writing essays and notes. Upon his death in 1981 in Vevey, Switzerland, it was noted that in the period since the last published book in 1952, he had rendered about 20,000 pages of philosophical writing. This is, by the way, typical of Sagittarius this kind of life. A longtime friend of Brunton's philosopher, Anthony Damiani, founder of Wisdom's Goldenrod Center in Philosophical Studies in 1972, coordinated the publishing effort together with a team of people including Paul Cash and Timothy, Timothy Smith. The Swedish-American publisher, Robert Larson, started publishing the 16-volume set in 1984. Uh, let's see. Hidden teachings beyond yoga. Brunton cannot be credited with introducing yoga to the West uh, because of the existence of other previous luminaries such as Blavatska, Vivekananda, and Yogananda, at least he holds a preeminent position in bringing to the West the best the Orient has to offer, the doctrine of mentalism. No other writer but Brunton has declared mentalism to be the esoteric doctrine of the Orient. Brunton is, is also the only writer to differentiate Oriental mentalism from Berkeley's. As the theory of relativity, according to Einstein, brings space and time together, so does mentalism unite spirit and matter. This phenomenon is explained by Brunton as being inherent in imagination. Brunton expounds the doctrine of mentalism in his magnum opus, first in part one, which is introductory and preparatory type of the hidden teachings beyond yoga, and last but not least, in a revelatory work named the Wisdom of the Overself. Jocelyn Godwin. Hey, Jocelyn Godwin, that's a name that came up through our friend, John Anthony West, stated, since discovering Brunton's work in the 1960s, I have found no reason to discard their philosophical principles. 
In the 1940s and 50s, Brunton lived with American author and former psychoanalyst Jeffrey Masson, the son of a Jewish-American friend of Brunton. As as Masson's parents were among a handful of Brunton's close disciples, initially influenced by Brunton, Masson gradually became disillusioned with him. According to Masson, Brunton singled him out as a potential heir to his spiritual kingdom. In 1956, Brunton decided that a third world war was imminent, and the Masons moved to Montevideo, since this location was considered safe. From Uruguay, Masson went uh, went at Brunton's bidding to study Sanskrit at Harvard. Brunton himself did not move to South America, instead spending some time living in New Zealand. Masson subsequently became proficient at Sanskrit and stated that Brunton did not have the facility with the language that he claimed. He wrote a scathingly critical account of Brunton titled, My Father's Guru, A Journey Through Spirituality and Disillusion. Jeffrey Masson lives in uh, California, by the way. So there are some details of the life of Paul Brunton, also born today. Very Sagittarian, I believe. Let me find my way back to the show page so I can get in here. Where did the show page go? Okay, here we go. Let's see. Keep moving here, moving, moving. Okay, let's see. Here we go. All right. We're back in the show page. Let's take a call. Hello there. Hello. Hi. Hello? You're on the air. Hey, Robert. It's Beverly. Hey, what's happening, Beverly? <laughs> Oh my God! I feel like all hell is breaking loose in in some ways in part of um, areas of my world, and I thought, wow, if ever I needed to get some insight, it's like right now. So I just called in. It's the first time I'm calling in. All right. Well, hey, uh, welcome. It's, <laughs> <clears throat> this is, this it's kind of it. talking to you, like in this context, right? Like I have to kind of what? teach you. That. As a guest, right? And you're not really, yeah. You're not really a guest. Beverly is a a, a dear, your friend who I have known since uh, nineteen, I believe, ninety four, right? Yeah. Yes, definitely. So, Beverly, we're going on twenty years now. That's a long time, Robert. Does that freak you out a little bit? Twenty years. Yes, it actually does because it just happened so quickly. It's it's amazing. I mean, I. Yeah, I'm pretty much freaked out by that uh, idea. Twenty years have gone by. I pretty much feel the same, though. Lots of things have changed. So Beverly uh, and I met at, at a Whole Life Expo, and I was giving a, a talk on ambient music, and she was in the audience listening to me give this talk about ambient music. And then, <laughs> and that was it, man. We've been we've been been friends and and uh, close ever since. So let's. Let's do your chart. Let's get into you. Uh, how about this? Let's go here. Here. And here. Okay, now I know you're born on what, the 24th of uh, October, right? September. September, 24th of September. And was that, 61 or? 60. 60, okay. All right, hold on. Right. You're two days after me. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, what time? Uh, 9.31, pretty sure. In the morning. Okay. A.M. Okay. And uh, was that New York? Yes. Um, Bayshore, New York. Oh, boy. Let's see. We this. It feels good to be on your show, Robert. This is so wild. I know. It's the first time you've called, huh? It is. Yeah, it oh. is. Okay. Here we go. Let's, I got you punched up here, looking at your chart. There you are in all your glory. Your Scorpio rising glory with the Scorpio moon. 
right? That's you, right? That's me. Yep. I seem to have forgotten you had a Scorpio moon. Well, that makes sense now. Um, okay, so looking at your chart, I think the big the big thing right now is Saturn, right? Saturn's right on your moon. I, mean, I just did the, uh, the shout-outs to where the planets are, and Saturn is directly on your moon. And uh, it's where, you, you know, you've got the Saturn-Uranus square, which... Um, is happening for a lot of people born, born with Pluto and Leo. And it's a tricky square because, you know, it's hitting us with this sense of real intense restlessness, frustration, limitation, and it's kind of hard to work out and work through. Um, so you've got that going on. And Uranus is up in your 10th house. So you've got to, you have to, you have to deal with Uranus. And, Uranus in the 10th house is like, you know, it's change. It's also the sign of astrology, by the way, up in the 10th house. So you are you are kind of struggling with um, dealing with that Uranus. Uranus in the 10th. How do you how do you radicalize? How do you liberate? How do you free yourself up in what you're doing? Right. That's what the, exactly. Saturn, Saturn is tried and true. Saturn is you've done this. You've done this. You've done this. You've done this. You've done this that this isn't really working anymore. But but because of the square, you're, you, it's not like if it's a trine, you just step into the trine and you go, wow, this is new, this is cool, this is groovy, I love it, you know, I'm doing this. The Saturn square is much more dynamic. There's like this push and pull. Should I let it go? Should I stay? Should I let it go? Should I stay? Do I move on? Do I hold on? You know, that's the Saturn you're on a square. And you have to somehow bridge that gap between – uh, innovating and recreating your career and your work and and sort of the tried and true methodology that you have been uh, have been employing for quite a while it's, the other big challenge for you is it's in the first house and so you have become identified in some way with what you do and I know what you do and you probably have all kinds of connections and all kinds of uh, friends and people that you go to, you know, meet at all these trade shows all around the world. It's really become what you've been doing has become sort of wrapped up in your identity to some extent. Now, I'm not saying it's a totality of who you are, but it, it is, it's a large part of kind of what you projected into a certain part of your world. But that has to, you have to resolve that. And so it's not an easy uh, resolution. It's almost like lifting weights. Squares are like lifting weights. You know, you work, and then you get burned out, and you have muscle fatigue, and then you get new muscle. You work, you get burned out, you have muscle fatigue, and you get new muscle. That, by the way, might be an interesting thing for you to get into, is actually lifting weights, working out, working out the square through physicality. And it's interesting because you're also dealing with that frustration, and working out would also help you deal with that frustration. Um, now, right. sat on the moon can be a lot of different things. Now, one of the things that you might also be going through is you might actually be going through some kind of uh, change hormonally with Saturn on your moon, uh, especially in the first house, and dealing with things like you know, procreation, um, you know, maybe entering into a phase where that might be ending, all that Saturn moon stuff. It would also hit you with your mom, responsibilities with your mom, you know, um, sort of the, the whole kind of, uh, matriarchal lineage that's also on your moon. Um, is this making sense? Yeah, incredibly. Yeah. There's I also, mean, it's right on. It's right on the nose yeah, with everything also, around um, identity and career and uh, struggling and uh, desiring to shift out of it. Not happening quick enough. Um, I need to make changes. I need to work that out. And I really get the analogy with the weights, it really, really, really uh, makes sense. And, uh, yes, so you're, you're hitting it right on the nail. So I other... don't understand one thing, though. Um, how long is, is the square going to be in effect? Is it a long-term thing? Because pretty much uh, all hell broke loose for me yesterday. And I'm kind of, you know, at a choice point, I would say. And I'm happy to be here. This is not new information. Yeah. And, you know, I feel, I feel like um, there's this whole other world 
waiting for me. And as much as, as I, you know, have at times prided myself on being, um, you know, uh, unafraid to go in, in, you know, very different directions and, um, you know, likely di- directions, I feel a little hesitation here. And I don't know if that's because of the the square going on or what, or it's a new yeah. identity. It's interesting. Yeah, I think I think a part of it has to do with the square um, because you're dealing with something new, which is Uranus versus something old, which is Saturn, right? And by the end of the year, Saturn will be at 20 degrees in Scorpio. So you, so you, you had your Saturn crisis. Whatever, whatever the hell that broke loose, that's the Saturn crisis. But now you have to deal with it, right? Now yeah. You have to deal with it. So um, the other thing, too, is, you know, you've got, you've got Saturn also in the third house. And uh, that's natally, right, 11 degrees. But, I, you know, it's been a while since I've looked at your chart. And, um, man, it's like it's amazing how close your chart is to my chart. Obviously, uh, obviously you're two days apart. But uh, you've got the – the only thing different about your chart is, is the moon, really. Everything else is pretty much lined up and the sun, uh, but not much, though. Um, but you have Saturn in the third house, and that is, you know, communication, sharing ideas, uh, writing – you know, all those things. And Pluto is going to be on your Saturn uh, next year, and very very quickly, actually, right around February, March of next year. So when you have the Pluto-Saturn conjunction, I think that that's a good thing. Um, and that will get you really focused about the type of information, the type of uh, things that you want to share, teach, write about, uh, and, and, you know, disseminate um, with people. So there's something about Pluto on your Saturn next year that really changes your thinking, changes how you share information, and makes you, in some ways, go deeper, go much, much deeper with your Saturn in the third. You know, Saturn in the third can sometimes indicate an inability to clearly articulate what you want to say, right? Sometimes it can be uh, learning disabilities. Sometimes it can be speech disorders with Saturn in the third. But what it means to me is that, is that you are somebody, whatever, wherever Saturn shows up in any house, over time you get much better at that house. And so by the time you get to the, the middle and, and the, the latter third of your life, the Saturn is really kicking in and you're, you're kind of humming with Saturn. So for you it's about right. sharing information. It's about uh, you know, working with groups, smaller groups, people 5, 10, 15, 20 people, maybe 30 people, writing, getting your idea, ideas down, getting very, very focused, and growing that, you know, through the arc of Pluto. Pluto's going to be in your third house for a while. I mean, you've got basically 10 degrees of Aquarius in your third house, so Pluto will be in your third house for the next, you know, 15 years. So you may as well get used to it and get down with, you know, uh, transforming your mind and transforming how you think and how you share that with other people. So I, you know, right. I, I think the sat, whatever you went through, you know, you've got Pluto. I mean, you've got Scorpio in the first house, so you will not feel things and experience things in a superficial kind of way. You will always, you know, be intense with your uh, experience with the world. So I think, I think if you go back, and I know a little bit about, you know, what you've done in the last few months. I think if you go back to the time that you were at Dom and Horror, and you were part, yeah. of that, part of that event, that event, I think, catalyzed what you went through with all hell breaking loose. And I think if you think back in time to that event, you might be able to make some kind of realization about whatever your intention was or what your thoughts were whatever you were carrying during that time. Does that make sense? Yes, it really does. And, um, you know, with Saturn in the third house, it's kind of an indicator at times for uh, communication to be a little stifled. I get that that was self-imposed and that it was really just like a, uh, you know, a reflection of, you know, um, what I was living through and what I'm transforming into because of that experience, you know? And um, 
I really appreciate this. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, you're welcome. And the other thing too, Bev, is that, you know, again, just looking at your chart, spending more time with your chart, you know, you have Mercury in the 12th house and it's square Saturn as well. So not only do you have Saturn in the third, but you have a Mercury Saturn square. So the challenge is to bring out all this information you've accrued over the years, right, that's hanging out in the 12th house and bring it down into the third, which is where your Saturn is. And Pluto is going to help with that, by the way. You know, you're going to get into the Pluto Mercury square. Um, you know, don't don't stress out about it. it. You know, that Pluto Mercury square is just going to be about intense focus and intense work. You know, and teach. I think I think you're going to be doing some teaching, but I see you teaching in small groups, working with smaller numbers of people. You know, uh, not ninth house. You know, no, like 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 not Paul Brunt and Sagittarian writing tomes of you know, uh, metaphysical treatises, but smaller, more compact, like either notebooks or, um, you know, smaller, more compact manuals or, you know, think of, think, you know, think of it along those lines, you know, chunk off okay. your information, right? Digestible, third house kinds of things. But I think that that's where you're headed, especially with Pluto, you know, moving closer and closer to your Saturn. So just do your best to work with the frustration, work out, you know, get into it, and, um, you know, just go from there. You know, Uranus, let's just look at Uranus really quickly, and then we'll send you out there. You have 510. Uranus is moving into your sixth house this year. It's almost there now. It's there by, by ingress, moving into the sixth house. The sixth house is purpose. It's dharma. It's mission. You know, it's service. It's all those things. And Uranus represents a radical break of when it enters into the sixth house. So it's recreating you know, your work. And and in 2014, Uranus gets to, I think, 15, 16. So you're just going to start to get into that Uranus, Uranus trying. So pick up the pieces, put it, to get, put it back together, but put it back together in a way that is meaningful for you and that you can make some kind of movement and commitment towards something that is more aligned with who you are. Because, again... That's Saturn in the first house. It's about reorganizing self and how self projects to the world and what the self does in the world. Okay? Yes. Thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you. Always, always great connecting with you. And take care of yourself and, you know, connect with me anytime. Reach out anytime. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Love you, Bev. Love you, too. Bye. Bye. So that's uh, Beverly. Yeah, I'll never forget. First time I met Beverly. Whole Life Expo, 1994. I was talking about ambient music and how ambient music was going to change the world. It kind of did in some ways. I had a room full of people. Kind of blew me away, actually. I played samples of the history of ambient music and why it was important culturally at that time. Changed my life. I met her. <laughs> All right. It is uh, 1248 here in Central Texas. You're listening to Navigating the Astrological Matrix. I'm Robert Phoenix. Um, if you have not checked out Guy on TV, I urge you to do so. Um, my first episode in the 11th house, which is my show on Guy on TV, is out now. You can get a 10-day trial Go to 11thhouse.tv. That's 11th, like the number 11, thhouse.tv. Very easy. That is my page, my vanity page. You can go there. If you sign up, I actually get credit for that. You can try it out for 10 days. It's $9.99 a month. And even if I were not on Guy TV, I would tell you, that it is a great deal. It is, it is the wave of the future. We are talking niche programming, and the niche programming is about your health and well-being. And you can find tons of videos and movies, not just videos, but they have movies there as well. I believe the uh, s- s- what is it, Cinema Circle, which is a spiritual movie kind of. Uh, business 
where they collate and curate spiritual movies. They have a deal with Gaim, so you can watch documentaries there. You can watch some feature-length stuff. But they have tons and tons of original programming. And George Norrie has a show there. Regina Meredith has a show there. David Wilcock has a show there. Um, so a lot of people have shows. Daniel Pinchbeck has a show there. And now yours truly, I have a show there. And there's just there's tons and tons and tons of content. And they've got everything from health-related material, Mike, Mike Adams, the health ranger, to really, uh, you know, kind of new agey, more new agey, kind of oneness, universal, universal consciousness stuff. You can find that there. But there's also, for people that are into alternative research, there are at least three to four videos on chemtrails. There's, there's more emerging content around secret societies and the role that, that they play in shaping our reality and our consciousness and to what end. So you can go there and check it out, 11thhouse.tv, that's me. Or you can go to Guy MTV. That's it. It's easy, but I won't get the credit for it. And I'm working on, I'm going out there uh, soon, and I'm going to be working on uh, three new shows. And one of the shows that I'm working on is a video representation of a post that I had on my website about the December 25th birthday, uh, which is, you know, historically been associated with the, the birth of Jesus Sananda Emmanuel. Um, I actually am looking at 9-11 as the actual birth date, and it makes so much sense. And I have been delving into the the labyrinthian, the labyrinthine, (laughs) uh, historical dates around 9-11. And some of the stuff that will come out in the video will blow your mind. Trust me on this. It will blow your mind. And it's part of, it is part of a continuum from 9-11 minus 3 BCE to right here, right now. It's part of a major continuum, which is altering our consciousness and our timeline. And we are very deeply in it right now. So that I'll be doing that when I'm up there in Boulder. And I've got two other shows that I'm working on as well, and we'll bang those out soon. So there's more content coming, and there's more content coming even after that. So this is kind of a major wave of production uh, in, the, uh, in the life here, which is an interesting development. All right, let me give out the number, 347-308-8995, 347 347- 308-8995. I can see a couple of good friends just listening. Some people just call in just to listen because that's how they get into this show. They just they just listen to me on the phone. That's how they do it because they can't get in any other way. Maybe they don't have computer access. Maybe for whatever reason the uh, it doesn't you know it won't work. So they dial in. And they listen. And you know what? I thank you for that. Thank you for being dedicated enough to listen to the show, to get on your phone and listen to it. And, uh, you know, I think it's Sandy, Sandy and the Gardner. Gardner, I bring you on, but if I did, I think people would think you're my co-host. So, and we have to scotch those rumors. It's not true. By the way, Gardner, who contributes quite a bit to Mr. Less Visible's world. Gardner, I've read your comments on Visible. You're a terrific writer, Gardner. And you should do more of that. You're very good. Very, very good. Don't sleep don't sleep on those skills. Three four seven three zero eight eighty nine ninety five. Okay, we're at the top of the hour. Why don't I play some music? Uh and we'll get back and we'll get into some more readings. Hopefully. If we don't, well, I'm not sure where we go after that. I guess I can talk some more. But today's show is about you. It's about you. It's about me and you together so we can be with each other. And I can look at your chart and see if there's something important in there that we can work on. Okay, let me find out where do I want to go, where do I want to go, where do I want to go musically. I have a ton of stuff musically, right? I have a lot. But I have to be careful, though, because uh, 
the new Google slash YouTube has been killing me on copyright claims lately. Why don't we do this? Let's play this. This is a, I played it last week. You guys loved it. Sumara by my friend Dwight Loop. Uh, so let's play. Let's let's get into this. It's uh, just a little over six minutes. Go to the bathroom, take a pee, make some tea, whatever it is you're gonna do. But I'll meet you back here at the top of the hour, Sumara, Dwight Loop.
that's Dwight Loop and Sundara Smara Smara. It's a cool tune, isn't it? Uh, if you have not heard the Friday show with Dwight and myself, you can go back and listen to it, hopefully, on the archives. That was from last Friday. It's about JFK. A lot of JFK ness. One of my favorite bands, well, not one of my favorite bands, one of my favorite band names of all time, JFKFC. It's kind of funny, don't you think? It's right up there with the Brian Jonestown Massacre. Um, it is 102 here, and I am going to look at a chart uh, in absentia, meaning I'm going to be looking at a chart here that uh, is for somebody who has requested me to look at a chart, very fascinating chart. I've never seen uh, this. Uh, it's, a, it's a young person, and they were born in 2010, so February 13, 2010. And there is a very intense concentration of Aquarius in the eighth house here, with also essentially two sort of uh, transposed or superimposed yods. You know, I was on uh, Nicholas Campion's site last night doing some reading, and he basically does not ascribe to this the notion of the yod. He doesn't really think it has a lot of significance. Um, I tend to. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not taking issue with him. He's a very. He's an extremely brilliant astrologer. But uh, it was just an interesting take on on the odd. So we're looking at a stellium in Aquarius now. Anytime you get into eighth house material, it is very difficult to access and at some point in time the identity of the person or aspects of the identity with that person in the eighth house. And I just, I know this from experience and having people in my life with eighth house planets. You cannot always see the totality of who they are. It will, it will emerge um, over time, getting to know them. So, as a mother looking at this chart, your child's personality will be something that will be a bit of a mystery at times, but it will always come out in unique ways. So, um, this child is an iconoclast, complete iconoclast, will follow the beat of his own drummer. He does have Jupiter and Pisces, which is very nice. And Venus there too as well. So that stellium with the with the, the moon, the sun, and Chiron, and Neptune. Um, that's very potent. The sun moon conjunction. This is the. This is the hidden story behind the parenting, right? This is the hidden story behind mother and father. And that is part of the eighth house as well. There's a chironic wound to conjunct the sun. So there's kind of a Hemingway-esque relationship with father here in the eighth house. It's the search for father, actually. That's what, that, it will take up a part of um, his life and part of his identity, finding, finding that aspect of father. Uh, and it will make him different. It will set him apart in some ways from everybody else. Now he will have an experience, a close relationship between a mother and a father figure in his life, but it will not be apparent or not be seen to the world in the way that the world normally views these things. Um, he will not channel emotion the same way as other kids do. He will be very objective up to a point. He can, be a he, he can be detached to a point. But after, after a certain amount of oversaturation or frustration, the emotions will come up. And they will come up in an explosive fashion. Um, 
I love the Venus Jupiter conjunction. Very loving, very kind, very compassionate. But he's not a wallflower, not with Leo rising, not with Mars on the ascendant, not with the Mars Uranus trying. He's forward thinking. Uranus in the ninth house exposes him to a lot of different ideas and beliefs early on in life. Uh, the Mars Uranus trine gives him uh, actually an ability to, to be very successful at sports. So I would encourage uh, sports, especially activity with Mars in Leo on the first house, on, the, on the ascendant, maybe combining sports with theater, sports or drama, circus training, things like that, you know, new circus stuff like Cirque du Soleil or something along those lines he might be quite good at. But he needs to burn off that energy. He can have a bit of a temper with that Mars Mercury opposition. You know, and those are fixed signs, they're both in fixed signs. So he can have a bit of a temper. He is a transformer. He is here to transform people, transform their lives. Pluto in the sixth house, he's a healer. Very, very deep, profound. He has potential to be a very deep and profound healer. And with True Node in the sixth house, in Capricorn, he needs to rise to a level of not just proficiency, but uh, management and overseeing um, large operations and working with people at a high level. But that's over a period of time. True Node in uh, the sixth house, and even with Pluto there to some extent, um, means that in some ways he'll get an early start in life. What I mean by that is, is that he will have um, a powerful focus in terms of kind of who he is and where he wants to go. And he'll dedicate himself towards that. Uh, 20 is a very important year for him. 20 is an important year. 20 is when things really um, sort of take off. He's going to have the Pluto uh, true node conjunction. That will happen in about uh, six to seven years. Uh, Saturn, he's got that Saturn in the third house. We talked about that a little earlier. Um, he will not do well. Here we go. He will not do well with traditional schooling. He will rebel with traditional schooling. That's Saturn opposing Uranus. He will be antsy. He will not like people telling him what to do or what to think, especially with all that Aquarius in the, uh, in the eighth house. And also Mercury in Aquarius. He's going to think for himself. You know, this is somebody who you're not going to be able to tell what to do. Luckily, he does not have the traits of a sociopath, in which case you'd be in trouble. Venus and Jupiter, very nice, brings compassion, brings love, tenderness into his life. Uh, does, uh, so he's got Pluto and the true node. Those are his only Earth signs. So he will know himself through work. He will ground himself and sort of uh, retain his residency on this planet through work and working hard. He might become a bit of a workaholic somewhere down the line. Uh, love and relationship is important, but only when somebody meets him in a mental space with his ideas. Communicating and sharing ideas is very important. Now, he has a nice trine to Saturn, which means he has uh, Mercury is exalted in Aquarius, and the trine to Saturn means that he has good power, concentration, good focus, but he will not, he will not dig, he will not dig public school, or I guess they call it private school in England. So there you go, there is the overview for that chart. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's how I see it. Martial arts would be good for him as well. Combination of martial arts, gymnastics, acrobatics, Circus work, maybe even some, you know, what do they play over there? Soccer, football, things like that. So there you go. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. It is 111 111. 111 111. Um, I was doing some, some really interesting research on 9 11, the day. And I found some. I found a really interesting, 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 interesting. Everything's everything is interesting, fascinating little factoid. 
and it has to do with Mamie Van Doren. Okay, I somehow got into Mamie Van Doren. I don't know how I got there last night. Oh, okay, I know how I got there. I was watching a movie, White Heat. I was watching White Heat on Turner Movie Classics or Turner Classics Movie, whatever they call it. And there is a, a guy in that movie. Is it, is it White Heat? Is that, is that the guy? No, no, no. Hold on. What movie was that? It was. Uh, no, it, yeah, it was White Heat. White Heat. There's a guy in that movie who plays a gangster. And uh, Jimmy Cagney kills him. His name is Steve Cochran. And uh, Steve Cochran, I looked him up, and I found out that he was one of Mamie Van Doren's lovers. And then I went to Mamie Van Doren. Mamie Van Doren was this uh, blonde bombshell. She was Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, Mamie Van Doren. They were the big three at that time in, in Hollywood. Mamie Van Doren is, was a notorious – what word would I use? It would be, it would be the, the same word we would use for, like a, a, you know, a, a dog, <laughs> for a man. Mamie Van Doren loved sex, and she had affairs with everybody, everybody. And there was a, a, a bit about Mamie Van Doren being at the Whiskey A Go-Go in 1964 – and she was there with Jane Mansfield, and the Beatles were there. The Beatles were at the Whiskey A Go Go in 1964 to hang out with Jane Mansfield. What's that all about? Of course, Jane Mansfield was a key member of the Church of Satan. The Church of Satan, right? Anton LaVey. Mansfield, Marilyn Monroe, Sammy Davis Jr., all these all these people, very strong ties with Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. By the way, I went to I went to school with Anton LaVey's niece. Junior high school. She showed me a paperback. And I'll never forget this. It was it was the Book of Satan or Satan's Bible or whatever it was. It was LaVey's book. I saw the name Anton LaVey. She said, this is my uncle. I'm like, oh, really? Interesting. So anyway, the Beatles are there hanging out with Marilyn Man- uh, Jane Mansfield at the Whiskey A Go-Go. And, I, and, I, and I, there's, a, there's a, a guy on uh, Facebook, Stephen. I hope to get him on my show one of these days. Stephen has the most thorough knowledge of the Beatles and PID, a.k.a. Paul is dead, Plastic Maka, all that stuff. Steven's got it. He knows his stuff inside out. So when I told him, hey, man, did you know that the Beatles were at the Whiskey A Go-Go in 1964, hanging out with Jane Mansfield? Did you know that? He says, oh, yeah, I knew that. And the rumor is is that John Lennon uh, pissed in her drink. How about that? So not only did he know that, but he also had a little, pun not intended, topper on that. Anyway, fascinating stuff, man. You get into these rabbit holes sometimes, and you just find the weirdest, weirdest thing. I'll tell you one other interesting factoid about 9-11, the day. I can't tell everything. You have to see the video. But there's some incredibly fascinating stuff around twins and twin events on 9-11 throughout history. And um, one of the events that I found fascinating was in 1850, there was a singer by the name of Jenny Lind. And she was known as the Swedish Nightingale. She was an opera singer. She came to the United States and performed for the first time in 1850 on 9-11. And I believe it was uh, 2011. Anna Lind, L-I-N-D-H, who was the PM of Sweden at that time, was stabbed and killed. Very strange death, by the way. So you have these two Lins, both Swedish, both having significant sort of moments on, on 9-11. Fa- fascinating. And there's more. Trust me, there's a lot more in this. But you'll have to watch the video. Um, okay. Uh, we are at uh, 117. 
I'm going to put out the call one more time. 347-308-8995. 347-308-8995. Call in. One other thing for the mystery chart, with all that stuff in the 8th house, you have to watch out for nightmares. Nightmares, intense dreams. He'll process a great deal of his life, and not just his life, but reality, this matrix reality, he will process through his dreams. So encourage him to talk about his dreams. Um, they're very powerful dreams. He's a profound dreamer. Um, allow him to do that. And the more he talks about it, the less he'll be afraid of them. Okay? There you go. That's uh, that's it. Um, 118. One more time. Here we go. Um, 347-308-8995. That's the number to call in. Have your chart read. Get all massaged. This is what I would call a psychic massage. A psychic massage. I can psychically massage you by reading your chart. How does that sound? Just get on the chair. Get on the table. Uh, well, let's see. We've got some interesting shows coming up. I believe on the 6th of December, uh, I'm going to have Andrew Norton Weber on. And Andrew Norton Weber is one of the kind of preeminent people on water. We're going to be doing a show on hexagonal water and water in general. Um, Andrew Norton Weber, some of you may know who he is. Um, he's going to get it. He's going to be on here. I'm going to try to get somebody from Langenberg again. We had Philip on last time and we'll get somebody from Langenberg to join in and talk about water. It's important. It's the most important thing on the planet. Without a doubt, hands down, water is the medium. So that's going to be on December 6th. And I'm also going to be interviewing, um, let me see if I can come up with his name here and say it correctly. This is uh, going to be an interesting show. Hold on here. Let me find the, okay, I'll just, uh, pyramids. Hold on, let me see if I can figure this out because I want to say his name correctly. Um, his name is Dr. Samir uh, Ozmanagic. Samir Ozmanagic. He's just down the down the freeway uh, in Houston, and he is the founder of the Bosnian Archaeological Park, and he has found pyramids in Bosnia. The mystery of Bosnians, Bosnia's uh, ancient pyramids. He's a contemporary. He's he's forty nine. And he's been in Texas for the last 16 years. I'm going to be interviewing him uh, next week. And I'm probably going to have him on. We're going to tape the interview. And I'm probably going to have him on the following week. Uh, and he is he, he's kind of like the next generation of John Anthony West. That's my sense. So we're, I'm going to have him on. And maybe I'll have somebody else on to get into the whole, you know, ancient pyramid and megalithic stuff on that day. So uh, Andrew Norton Weber, he'll be on the 6th, and Dr. Samir Ozmanagic, he'll be on shortly thereafter. He's a contractor in Houston, but he's also, he's also a doctor. Let's take a call. Hello there. Hey, Robert. Is it Kate? Who is this, Kate? No, it's Fran. Oh, Fran. Hey, what's happening, Fran? Oh, trying to stay warm up here up in Toronto. Yeah? Well, how's that working out? Are you managing to uh, to warm the cockles? Well, trying. It's really kind of cold up here, but we didn't get hit with a lot of snow like the uh, states did, so we're pretty lucky. Oh, cool. Good. Excellent. You know, I've got a, I've got a, uh, a pocket up there in Toronto of people that listen to me. And yeah. I get a lot of readings from Toronto. Well, that's good. It's interesting. Yeah. In fact, I've got a reading set up tomorrow with a woman from Toronto. Great. So Toronto might be a place for me to go one of these days. Absolutely. You're more than welcome to come up and visit. Maybe we could do like a live event from Toronto or something. 
sure, I could help you set it up, or you could stay and stay with us, or whatever. But if you want to come up, just let me know. That'd be fun. That'd be a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, it would be fun. You'd you'd like it. You'd like it. It's very it's very progressive up here. How how uh, how far away is Montreal from Toronto? Um, by train or car, it's about five hours, but it's like an hour flight. You get them all day from Porter Airline. They're reasonable. It's like an hour, 45 minutes. Huh? I've always wanted to go to Montreal as well. It's a great city. It really is. It's it's the closest thing to Europe you're going to get on the North American continent. Yeah, I believe that. Um, This was great, too. Well, I wanted to um I wanted to give you another mystery chart to look at to compare the Aquarian chart and I think it would be interesting for you to take okay. a look at it. All right, let me uh, go in and make a few changes here to the old Okay. chart uh And you'll thing. see why when you pull it up. All right, go ahead. So this person was born on January 11th. 2013 at 11:33 a.m. January 11th, 2013. Okay. At 11:33 a.m. 11:33. Interesting. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. And the city is Mississauga. So it's like Mississippi. M I S S I S S A U G A. And that's in Ontario, O-N. There it is. Yes. Okay. So I thought this would contrast nicely with your aquarium stellium to look at some something similar but different. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it's up in the 10th house with all that Capricorn. Yes. Yeah, very different. It's a very different personality. Um, and... Well, wow, talk about driven. This mm-hmm. will be this will be someone who has intense, extreme focus, knows their mission early on in life. Right? Will know the mission. Yes. Will go through, by the way, a series of intense initiations early on to confirm um, who they are, why they're here. Yeah, the the early years will not be casual for this person. No, no. You know, Pluto conjuncting Mercury next year, very powerful. Um, so 2013, so we're into 2014. Um, so that's like first first language, you know, first mm-hmm. you know first words. But they will be unusual. They'll be they'll be like uh, advanced, very advanced. You know, either that or the possibility that they may not talk at all. One of those Okay. Two. Right. It will, I, it will either be when are they going when when is this is this a boy? It's a boy, yes. So when is when is he going to talk? It will either right. be when is he going to talk or oh my god, how did he string those three words together? Right. So it'll be one of those two things. Right. Um in 24 2015 2015, Pluto gets close. 2015, 2016, that's the Pluto-Mercury conjunction, close in 2014, Uh closer in 2015. But the Pluto-Moon conjunction is very powerful Right. at that point in time. Um, You know, it's a little, it's not, you know, anytime you get up to Pluto-Moon, it is not in, it is not trivial or inconsequential, right? And that can mean anything from uh, separation from the mother, right? Uh, and but what's what's interesting here is that just like the other chart, you have the sun moon conjunction, right? That's why I brought means, it up. Yeah, which means there's a close connection between the mother and the father, right? But in the other chart, it was hidden. There was a mystery around that. In this chart, there's not right. much of a mystery. Both the mother and the father will play a role in terms of shaping this uh, child, and this means consciousness in terms of what it does. But that Pluto-Moon conjunction could be anything from maybe going to school for the first time and having to peel off from mother, and that could be sort of traumatizing in some ways. Right. Or, you know, and I, I don't like to get into dark predictive models, 
but right. it certainly um, looks like a very intense connection to the maternal figure at a young age, in right. one in one that really um, alters um, the emotional sort of uh, a chronometer for right. for, a, for a lifetime, really. And then the same yeah. thing happens with the father later on, though, much later. The, right. the, the Pluto, the Pluto transit through the tenth is powerful, and then with Pluto right. on in heaven, it's like setting the tone for the rest of the. This is a being that has said, "I'm coming in, and I, I'm going. I don't know. Uh, you know, do I care what happens? Sure, I do care, but." Um, I will go through it, and I will go through it early, and it will yeah. be intense, and it will right. alter everything about who I am and what I do. Do you, do you see this person because we're dealing with Capricorn? So we also know Capricorn can also be a ruthless sign. Do you see this person as an enlightened person, the potential for enlightenment, or, or more of a ruthless person with this? You can go out. That's either what way. I say too. Okay, yeah. so let me let me throw something in. His son is exact on my moon. Uh-huh. So I have moon Capricorn at 21. Right. His moon, again, is my moon, okay, and his moon is conjunct my husband's moon. So this is a friend of ours child, and they're very different in terms mm-hmm. of she's Russian. This is actually someone we went for the baptism. Okay. Yeah. So... Uh- we're almost out of time here, so I'm just going to continue yeah. to talk to you a bit, Fran. But I just sure. want to tell I wish want uh, want to wish everybody who celebrates these things uh, to have a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, give thanks for who you are, and what you are, and who you have, and what you have in your life, and what you can share with other people. Uh, take the take take the historicity out of it, redefine it for yourself, and make it meaningful. Um, and I'll be back. Not, we won't have a show on Friday but I'll be back in the following Monday. Uh, so thank you for joining in. Uh, real quick, Fran, the, the, yeah. the Neptune-Chiron uh, conjunction in the 12th house, is it, it hides a tender and hidden heart, uh, a hidden and compassionate heart. That's so he what I thought. That the people won't, he won't, they won't see it very much, right? Right, right. They won't right. see it very much at all. And even the other water in his chart is Saturn, it's Scorpio. You know, it's almost like a burden in some ways. Emotion can be a bit of a burden, you know, but right. but at the end of the day, uh, this person is very intense and will not be uh, a superficial or um, he won't be somebody that will, will fade into the background of life. People will know who this person is. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was trying his, his Mars conjuncts my Venus exact, too. So I'm trying to help bring out for him in a, in a, in a positive way, um, you know, some of the more positive aspects so he doesn't become the ruthless tyrant in the 10th house. Yeah, that's good. That's what I'm concerned about. Yeah. Well, again, Pluto, you know, will have its way, and he'll have to just deal with it. He signed up for it, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. That's what uh, I was going to say, great job on all your Gaim. I'm going to sign up and take a look and see what you're doing, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. I guess so. You know, we'll. How's uh, it going? It's, it's. I mean, it's going pretty well. You know, I'm doing my best to, you know, keep my my board on that wave, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's hard. Everything. Everything. That everything's going so fast, and it's just very hard to stay grounded right now for the next couple of years. So. Well, it's tricky for me because I, you know, being you doing that makes me, you know, even more public than kind of I am right now, right? Um, right. Which I don't necessarily have a problem with per se, but I have Saturn going through my twelfth house, which is not a very right. public aspect. So right. I have to figure it. I, that's my dance right now. Yeah. Well, I, you know, you know, you, at least you have the tools because of who you are and what you do to at least look at it. The, the thing is, at times, having your objectivity for yourself. Right. Any person, you know, that's sometimes the problem I have, having objectivity for myself. So, I, you know, I don't want to delude myself when I look at my own chart, you know. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it's so. true. It can be a little tricky, uh, but you're right. I, I do my what best you- to be objective. 
Go ahead. What are you doing for your Thanksgiving? I heard you having corn. I, I was listening to your corn tamales or your corn. Are you are you staying in um, Dallas? I mean, uh, well, Austin? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, normally I would have my son over uh, in the evening, but it didn't work out like that this year. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to be flying solo, and I just I just have to – he'll come over later in the night. He'll come over around 8 o'clock at night. Um, so I have to um, just kind of redefine it for myself, which I'll, I'll be fine. Yeah, are things working out a little bit, bit better with your ex on all that? I know you were telling me you were having a little difficulty. Yeah, no, co- no comment on that right now. Okay, okay. Well, mm-hmm. I don't mean to pry. That's okay. But Friday, though, we're going to have – we're going to do Thanksgiving on Friday. And well, that's I got, good. Yeah, and I got a turducken. Oh, good. Good. So, a turducken, which is a turkey. Well, it's a modified turducken. It's a turducken roll, so it's turkey breast, and inside the turkey breast is, is duck and chicken and a crawfish jambalaya. So we're going to cook that. Well, that sounds great, Robert. Well, I wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. I know you probably have got to get on to something else. I appreciate your taking my call. I just thought for your listeners it would be kind of interesting to look at the chart and compare two charts with stelliums right next to an oh, Aquarian absolutely. and a Capricorn. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Fran. Thanks for chiming in, and God bless, and we'll, we'll see you out there somewhere in the ethers. All right. Take care, dear. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. 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 It's our friend Fran from Toronto. All right, that's it. We've reached the end of the show. I'll be back on Monday with the uh, the mashup, no forecast on Friday, taking the day off. You know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real, your heart to stay open to what's possible. This is Robert Phoenix. Uh, again, uh, have a great Thanksgiving defined on your own terms. I'll see you on Monday. We are living in a computer programmed reality And the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this. Such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.